Dr. Hamdani is an assistant professor of religion at the Augustana College and holds a PhD and two master's degrees in Islamic studies from Harvard University. His dissertation, Revelation in Islam, Quranic, Sunni and Shi's male perspectives won best PhD dissertation of the year from the Foundation of Iranian Studies in 2020. And uh, Dr. Hamdani will be presenting on divine words, Ismaili doctrines of revelation and prophethood from Nasiri Khosro to Sharastani. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for this kind invitation to this conference. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Dr. Daggy and uh, Dr. Daftari for putting this together and obviously a very, a very difficult time for everyone. So thank you so much. It's my honor and privilege uh, to be with you uh, this morning, at least it's this morning uh, for me and for those of us in this part of the world. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today, uh, share with you uh, some of my research where I've been comparing certain teachings of uh, Nasr al-Khusro and Abd al-Karim uh, This is a, a sort of a, an artwork of uh, Nasr al-Khusro that I found um, by, by a, a, an Ismaili artist, actually. And um, I could not find uh, any sort of portrait of Shahristani. The only uh, Shahristani that uh, I was able to find uh, was Shahristani, the famous horse. Uh, this, of course, is Shahristani, the derby winner, uh, the horse bred by uh, the current Ismaili Imam, Shakri Malhusseini Aga Khan IV. And, and frankly, in my family, that's the first Shahristani we heard of because we follow these, these horses. Um, but I'll come back to this at the end on why this notion of a horse today uh, or in our time named Shahristani is actually quite symbolically appropriate. Uh, there's a lot of scholarship on the figure of Shahristani. Some of you have already heard his name in, in several of the talks today. Uh, I'm going to forego giving you a bio of Nasr al-Khusro and Shahristani. Time doesn't permit me. I'm assuming people are somewhat familiar uh, with these great luminaries. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Shahristani was a uh, Muslim theologian uh, and uh, Quranic exegete. And uh, he was educated in Nishapur by famous Sunni scholars. He taught for three years at the Nizamiya in Baghdad. Uh, he worked for the Seljuk Sultan Sanjar. Uh, he wrote several major works. For most of his career and, and thereafter, Shah Rasani was thought to be a Sunni Ash'ari theologian. However, uh, there's been a lot of scholarship, including scholarship by people, uh, uh, people here today, uh, Toby Meyer, uh, Dariush Muhammad Poor. Uh, hello, guys. It's good to see both of you. Uh, and this, this scholarship has actually demonstrated in a very careful, painstaking way uh, that Shahristani had uh, Ismaili convictions. He certainly uh, held, held on to Ismaili teachings. Uh, most recently in a book that has just come out, uh, the book Command and Creation, edited by uh, Dr. Poor, uh, it is claimed, uh, argued well, that Shahristani was a high-ranking uh, Nizari Ismaili Dai of some sort. So my work is really built on this prior scholarship that some people at the current Institute of Ismaili Studies have, have done in a, in a really good way. So the question that I'm asking is uh, whom or what is the source of Shahristani's Ismaili esoteric teaching? So this is a purely historical question. I'm not here to make judgments on whether Shahristani is correct, uh, whether his teachings are valid or not valid or any of that. This is a purely historical question that I'm trying to answer. Uh, my hypothesis, based on sort of where I'm coming from, is that Shahristani derived his Ismaili theocosmological and hermeneutical ideas in large part from the writings of Nasr al-Khusru, Nasr al-Khusru, the uh, Fatimid Ismaili Hujja of Khorasan, right? the um, reputed founder of the entire Central Asian uh, Ismaili tradition. Uh, so this is my, my main claim. Uh, and I'm not saying Shah Rastani just copies Nasser al-Khusru. I'm saying that Nasser al-Khusru's ideas are the starting point for what Shah Rastani does. Uh, I have a prior study, uh, which was published a couple of years ago, where I've argued that actually even Al-Ghazali, in terms of Al-Ghazali's knowledge of uh, 
Ismaili cosmology and hermeneutics that Al-Ghazali had access to the teachings of Nasser al-Khusro in some way. Uh, so I have a larger Shahrastani project going on. It consists of three studies. Um, the first study I presented two years ago, and in that first study, which I'm not going to talk about here, but I've put a summary of that study on the screen for you. Uh, so I've shown in that first study, it's not published, but I can share it for those who want it. Um, Charasani himself adheres to the doctrines that he attributes to the classical Ismailis or the classical Bathania. Charasani, secondly, uh, his project was about merging the two wisdoms, the Hikmatain. Uh, this is modeled directly from Nasser al-Khusro's own work, and thanks to Toby Meyer for, for showing us that. And finally, I've shown in that first paper, Shahrastani's Neoplatonic cosmology pretty much matches exactly uh, Nasser al-Khusro's cosmology, and that includes the creation and command hermeneutic. Today's paper is a sequel to my prior work, and I'm looking at cosmology, revelation, and uh, angelology uh, between Nasser al-Khusro and Shahrastani. So again, this is a purely historical investigation uh, in terms of what I'm doing. So let us begin then. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Nasser al-Khusro and, and, and many of the Fatimid dais, and this even continues into the Nizari period, uh, many of these Ismaili dais uh, adhere to a uh, Neoplatonic cosmology, which I have sort of diagrammed for you uh, on the screen. Uh, time doesn't permit me to explain to you the function of each of these uh, Neoplatonic uh, levels or hypostases, uh, but I'm sure they're familiar. These are familiar terms. Um, what I like to focus on is uh, how Nasser al-Khusro's understanding of this cosmology was actually innovative. Uh, and, and here's how it was. Um, Nasser al-Khusro has modeled uh, the relationship between these different levels of the spiritual and cosmic hierarchy. He has talked about it in terms of divine writing. Uh, so at the top here, you have God's speech, right? The Kalamala, the Kalamatala, God's command. Uh, but what Nasser al-Khusro tells us, is he says that each level is like a pen and each lower level is like a tablet. So the intellect is the pen and the soul is the tablet. And then going forward, the soul is the pen and prime matter is the tablet. So what is being the, the substance of this Neoplatonic cosmology, the content that's being conveyed from level to level, what is being manifested is what Nasser al-Khusro calls God's writing. Uh, this should. This is not physical writing. We're not talking about Arabic. Uh, we're talking about archetypes. We're talking about essences. We're talking about cosmic relationships or Neoplatonic forms. So that's what Nasser al-Khusro calls God's writing. And, and this is actually quite important uh, because another way he's talked about the whole system is to say that you have God's speech. God's speech manifests as God's writing and God's writing manifests in the world. God's writing is manifest throughout the cosmos, throughout the spiritual and the physical realms. Uh, you have the reflection, the manifestation of God's writing. Uh, and this is a, a unique to Nasser al-Khusro. You don't really have Sijistani or Kirmani talking about this. And the one thing I'll add is that in, when he does talk about this, Nasser al-Khusro tells us that God's writing is equivalent, it's identical to what the Quran refers to as the Kalimat Allah the words of God. Uh, and, and here, Nasr al-Khusru refers to a special Quranic verse, which says, you know, if, if uh, all the oceans were ink and all the trees were pens, uh, the Quran says, the words of my Lord would never be exhausted. Nasr al-Khusru glosses that and says, you know, the divine writing will never be exhausted. So this is Nasr al-Khusru's cosmology. It's unique to him. Uh, you don't have people before him saying this. So now let's compare that to Shahrastani. What does Shahrastani do? Well, we note that actually Shahrastani adheres to the same Neoplatonic cos uh, cosmological hierarchy as Nasser al-Khusru. In, in Shahrastani's tafsir, uh, Mafati al-Asrar, this is actually well laid out. Uh, but then Shahrastani also has this additional dimension to it. So Shahrastani refers to these Neoplatonic ranks as the sublime letters. Again, we're not talking about physical language, but he's using letters as an analogy. These are like sub, these are sublime letters, you know, met, you know, cosmic letters, and the the relationships between these different letters, um, those are what Shahrastani refers to as God's words, and he uses the term holy words, sublime words, perfect words, and again, these 
divine words. This is not Arabic, right? We're not talking about linguistic words. Uh, we are talking about cosmic archetypes. We're talking about, you know, essences in a sense. So for Shahrastani, uh, the way he talks about this is that he says, well, there's a manifestation uh, from God's command to God's words and then from God's words into existence, cosmic existence. And we have this great quote from one of Shahrastani's writings, which I've trans taken Steigerwald's translation of it because it's very clear. But he talks about this. He says, the divine command that's up here is pre-existent and his multiple kalimat, divine words, are eternal. So that's talking about this. And here Shahrastani basically lays out the different relationship, the hierarchy between God's command God's words and basically spiritual existence and physical existence. Uh, in, in other places in his tafsir, uh, Shahrastani also lays out the same relationship. So again, you have this, in a nutshell, you have this threefold hierarchy. You have God's command, God's words, and the corporeal physical world. That's what we have. So what I'm saying at this point, actually, is uh, I believe what has happened is Shahrastani has, has learned the original model from Nasr al-Khusro, and then he's further developed it. Uh, he's changed the terminology. Nasr al-Khusro had God's writing, Shahrastani has God's words. But I would say functionally, conceptually, both thinkers have the same cosmology, and they both stand out from other Ismaili thinkers uh, in their adoption of this particular system. So now let's move to the next topic, which is prophetic wahi, prophetic revelation. And again, I'll begin with Nasser al-Khusru. So now if we zoom out, if we take away some of the complexities, uh, what we have cosmologically or theologically for Nasser al-Khusru is this. You have two levels, God's speech, and then you have God's writing. Once again, I remind people, God's writing, by this term, Nasser al-Khusru is not talking about a physical linguistic writing. He's talking about cosmic writing. Uh, Neoplatonic archetypes, in a sense. What's very interesting is how Nasr al Khusru talks about prophetic revelation or Wahi. A according to him, Wahi is basically a spiritual process, uh, a spiritual awareness by which the Prophet Muhammad, through his soul, becomes informed of God's writing. All right, so Prophet Muhammad experiences spiritually the divine writing these Neoplatonic cosmic archetypes. That is how Nasr al-Khusru def uh, defines Wahi. Uh, he goes on to tell us that Wahi, which is often translated as you know, divine inspiration, uh, is an illusion, isharati, and it is not auditory. So according to Nasr al-Khusru and other Ismailis, Prophet Muhammad, when he experiences revelation, he doesn't actually hear Arabic words. That's actually a Sunni position. Right, the idea that that the Quran was dictated to the Prophet Muhammad in Arabic—that's a Sunni view. This is not the historical Ismaili view, despite the fact that, frankly, many people today, including Ismailis, are unaware of this. But when it comes to Nasr al-Khusru, it's very important to keep that in mind. So he speaks of Wahi as a spiritual illumination, and the content of that illumination to the Prophet is the divine writing that you see here in this model. Another thing to keep in mind. Uh, in his description of Wahi, uh, is for Nasr al-Khusru, Wahi is very quick. It's almost like an instantaneous type of communication. So it does not involve any language or any sort of physicality. Then, according to Nasr al-Khusru, what the Prophet Muhammad does is he receives this nonverbal Wahi, which is the knowledge of the divine writing, and then the Prophet Muhammad translates that into the Arabic Quran. Uh, as we know it. And he doesn't only translate it as the Arabic Quran, but frankly, according to Nasr al Khusro, everything, all the guidance given by the Prophet, whether it's Quranic or non Quranic, uh, what the Sunnis call the Sunnah or the Hadith, all of that is has the status uh, of manifesting God's speech to the point where Nasr al Khusro says that the Prophet occupies the station of God, Manzilat, the station of God on earth. His speech is the speech of God. His act is the act of God. Again, he says the messenger who holds the place of God is the king of the two worlds. So from Nasr al-Khusro, the prophet Muhammad as a person, virtually he is a manifestation, a, a representative of God on earth. So now let's switch over 
to Shahrastani. What does Shahrastani have to say about prophetic revelation about Wahi? Uh, two terms to keep in mind in Shahrastani's worldview and, and scholars like Toby Meyer, who's here, he knows way more about this than I do. That's where I learned this from. Um, mustar and Mazhar. Mustar is a root principle, the source of manifestation. Mazhar is a place of manifestation, like a mirror uh, that is reflecting the source or the principle. Uh, so for Sharastani, God's speech, God's command, uh, the eternal word of God is a mustar. And then God's words, which we've talked about, is a mazhar. And likewise, uh, God's words are the mazdar, and Prophet Muhammad is a mazhar. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Shah Rastani where he lays this out. Uh, it's very important to know what he says, and I'm just going to point to what's important. So first he says that the first command, which is here, when it manifested through the holy words, which is here, and the words manifested through the glorious Quran. Uh, the first locus of manifestation, so the first locus of manifestation uh, of the command and the words of God in this world is the person of Al-Mustafa, that's the Prophet Muhammad or his soul, his mind, or his heart. Uh, Sharistani then goes on to describe revelation or inspiration, wahi, uh, like mirrors. Uh, so he's talking about the reflection of God's words in the mirror of the prophet's heart. That's how he, he describes wahi. Uh, and he says wahi, in this sense, is uh, mo the most inspired manner of what is capacitated and the quickest manner of what is awaited. Notice this link with quickness compared to what Nasser al Khosrow said. Uh, and then what happens is then the prophet, the prophet experiences God's words. And again, these are not, these are not Arabic words. These are sort of archetypal essences. The prophet experiences those uh, through Wahi. And then the prophet himself becomes the mustar, the source for what we call the Quran, which Shah Rastani calls the sanctified word. So there's this hierarchy going on. Uh, and, and this is a theme throughout Shah Rastani's tafsir, that the prophets are experiencing the holy words of God, and then the prophets are articulating those holy words in actual human language, you know, the sanctified words. Uh, so again, I'm saying that this is derived from Nasr al-Khusru's own understanding. Uh, of revelation and of divine right. The only real change, thank you. The only real change we have mainly is terminology. I'm not saying it's exactly the same. Sharistani has developed this stuff further because every Ismaili thinker is doing some creative work. But I believe Nasr al own views are the, the primary source for this. The last example that I'll deal with, and I'll be quick about it, uh, is their notion of uh, angelology. Uh, so in Jami al-Hikmatayn, Nasr al-Khusru uh, articulates a certain viewpoint where he talks about spiritual angels. And then he says, these spiritual angels are manifested uh, in the physical world through the planets and the stars. And those planets and stars, they, their influence on the earth is responsible for the physical existence of plants, animals, and humans. So Nasr al-Khusru says this in, in Jami al-Hikmatayn. And Nasr al-Khusru attributes this position to the Sabians, right? He attributes it to this group known as the Sabians who, who sort of revere or worship the planets and the stars. But Nasr al-Khusru adds something to that. He affirms all this and he adds something of his own, speaking as the Ismailis. He says that, well, just as the planets and the stars are like the, meet, the manifestation of these spiritual angels, parallel to the planets and the stars, you have the prophets and the imams. And the prophets and the imams they are also intermediaries for the spiritual actuality of human beings. So the prophets and the imams take humans from potentiality to actuality. Uh, I believe that Shah Rastani has articulated almost the exact same doctrine in his Kitab al-Milal, which is a debate. There's a section which stages a debate between the Sabians and the Hunafa. And the Hunafa's position, which is Shah Rastani's own position, is basically the same thing as what Nasr al-Khusru said uh, in Jami al-Hikmatayn. Um, due to, the, to time, I'm not going to read all this out for you, but I'm just putting it there uh, for your information. So this is another piece of evidence that links the two thinkers. So let me end then. Um, I told you I would come back to this, this picture of, of, of the horse Shah Rastani, the derby winner, derby winning horse Shah Rastani, which has owned and, and, and was bred by the current Ismaili Imam. Uh, why, is, why is it symbolically appropriate? Well, there's a hadith 
uh, where the prophet said, goodness is knotted up in the four locks of horses until the day of resurrection. And Nasr al-Khusru himself in Wajidin interpreted that hadith. He said in this hadith, the horses symbolize the imam's hujaz, which is the highest ranking dais. Their four locks represent these other dais. So it is likely I'm saying that Charistani was not only a high ranking guy, uh, he was perhaps trained in Nasr al-Khusru's teachings. And practically, Shahrastani, what we see him doing is he's exegeting the esoteric meaning of the Quran uh, practically as an independent authority, but he, he claims that it's all done on the authority of the Athal Bayat. So what I'm suggesting then is perhaps Shahrastani in his own lifetime functioned not just as an Ismaili Dai, but as an Ismaili Huja, which is the higher ranking level, the higher level of Dai. Uh, and if Shahrastani was functioning as a Huja, then in fact, um, by some coincidence, uh, the image of the horse Shahrastani that we have today uh, in, by, with the current Ismaili Imam is perhaps quite appropriate symbolically uh, for the historical person of Shahrastani, who if he was a Huja, he was among the quote unquote horses of the Ismaili Imam of his own time. Thank you very much.